Namaste and welcome to this exciting episode of Satology, debunking mythology. Satology means science of truth, the study of truth. Opposite of that is mythology which is, or mythology, which means science or study of fake lie or imagination. Aap sabko Satology ke is nay episode mein baut baut swagat hai. I have a very, very special guest. I've been trying to get him for a long time. We've been chatting on the WhatsApp and uh, luckily he had time today and we will be having some open frank conversation sathology style with him aap sab ke show ko dekhega aur mujhe apna feedback zarur dijiyega so let us welcome admiral shekhar sena namaste sir and welcome to the show thank you very much and thank you for getting me on your show i have always enjoyed conversation with you i'm so grateful to you and uh, one of the things i really loved my last conversation a lot of things have happened since we spoke last a lot of things have happened and the biggest thing which is really shocked the west is the way indian navy rescued two ships and even the big big i mean american navy and other european navies were not able to do that so how do you see this whole incident in the geopolitical perspective of the world well firstly let me wish your viewers very happy new year and we have a great time and i hope the indo us relations uh, you know scale absolutely new heights there will be ups and downs but uh, uh, the bound to happen in two democracy uh, that's a that's a very uh, you know big question and really uh, uh, i hope i'm able to address it you know what has happened in these all these days that uh, us navy has got to know the indian navy uh, maybe a little late but uh, you know now they know us quite well um, and therefore the american navy the us navy has got to uh, realize that indian ocean uh, can be taken care uh, by the indian navy by and large uh, we have the assets and we have the will and we have been doing it for a long time even when uh, you know the us navy was not quite interacting with the indian navy i go back to the uh, very early sort of 90s uh, all our all our uh, you know the doctrines have said uh, that indian navy will uh, see that the trade and commerce and the sea lanes of communication in the indian ocean is safeguarded by the indian navy and all our build up has been done with that intention for a long time it's uh, only you know in from 93 onwards uh, that is after the fall of the soviet empire and the end of cold war that the us navy began to uh, look at the us indian navy as a you know as a sort of a, perspective partner if you like and uh, in our all doctrines uh, in our deal from right from beginning we have said the indian ocean our responsibility lies starting from gulf of aden right up to the straits of malacca which is a big way uh, and that is why the that is why the navy has been built around that uh, and therefore our presence in the indian ocean is 24/7 uh you can say that you cannot be all over because it's a uh, you know diameter of nearly 3000 kilometers yes indian ocean the, the area that i specify uh from the east coast of africa to the malacca straits or maybe sunda strait and lombok strait which is further down in the south uh and one navy alone cannot do it i again take you back to 2007 when then cno admiral mike mullen he was in india and i was commanding the western fleet at that time and we were walking on the deck of the our aircraft carrier much smaller by comparison to the american carriers and uh, he was quite happy he didn't realize that the indian navy had so much of capability uh, and he mentioned that uh, you know to ensure maritime security of the world and what he meant was the 70% of the world is water oceans he said that you require a thousand ship navy unfortunately the media got it wrong 
even back in the US and India, they said that the US Navy now wants to build a Navy of thousand ships. But that is not correct. I was, I was at pains to explain to them that what he meant was all navies combined in the world should have thousand ships to ensure security. And he was, he was a man with a lot of foresight. Mind you, in spite of the uh, Chinese having overtaken a number of ships uh, to U.S. Navy, my sense is that the world still hasn't hit thousand ship uh, line yet, all told, all combined. Uh, so that was his foresight. And as you can see that we will have to cooperate and cooperation is must at sea because of the area being very vast. Uh, and without cooperation, one Navy cannot really uh, look after full security because of the size of the ocean. Why it has surprised the Americans and the U.S. Navy particularly as to the rapidity with which we reach the spot. And that means that we knew as to who is where at all times. And this is called the maritime domain awareness. The Indians have a very strong, robust maritime domain awareness network. The headquarter is in uh, is in Gurgaon, it's a nearby town, and the feed is given from all our ships, submarines, and aircraft who are deployed in seven strategic locations, which I will come to later. Uh, either submarine or ship or aircraft are operating in this area. And when I say aircraft, I mean UAVs also. Now that, you know, the Americans have leased us the Predator, the MQ-9. Uh, and I hope that, you know, the uh, sanction or the LOA, as they call, letter of approval for the 15 more uh, comes very quickly from the U.S. administration. It is pending for quite some time. And I hope that these incidents will encourage the U.S. to do that very quickly, being the quad partner. So we were there, and the Maritime Domain Awareness Network is a 24-7. There are 28 countries who participate. And we also have representatives of almost seven, eight navies who are posted in that area, which includes the U.S. Navy, the Royal Navy, the Australian Navy, because we are all partners. This is something which everybody should know. Seafarers must know. Seafarers have the right to innocent passage. Every ship in the sea is not a warship. In fact, the 90% of the ships are engaged in trade, commerce, which is for prosperity and good of the people, as we call it, for common good. So we are not only looking at the Indian flagships, as you've seen. None of these were Indian flagships except for one. And the uh, moment a distress call is given, Adi, we, uh, you know, it is picked up by various satellites. Uh, it is on the ultra, uh, the UHF band. And we have an organization of the UK controlled center in the Gulf, which keeps monitoring the, you know, the main cause. And that is passed to the, what is called the Maritime Regional Control Center, the MRCC. And they're also in direct link with the Indian Ocean Fusion Center in Gurgaon that I'm talking about. And immediately the positions are updated. At any one time, there are almost 50,000 contacts on their radar. So it's not easy to find uh, as to who is where, particularly the warships. But in this case, I will come back to the question that you asked. In these cases, the first two, because our ships are always on patrol in the Gulf of Aden, in the Persian Gulf, in the Northern Arabian Sea and in the Southern Arabian Sea. Always on patrol, always. 24-7. Oh. Ships, aircraft or somebody. Somebody will be there monitoring. And they pass the data to the satellite link of every contact into the Maritime Domain Awareness Network, which is by controlled by a satellite called GSAT-7. GSAT-7 is dedicated to maritime. And it, it can look at entire Indian Ocean. So that is one. And if you recall, I will divulge a little bit. I will sort of go a little bit away. That in May uh, 2021, 22, uh, when the summit of uh, Quad took place in Tokyo, 
President Biden announced that uh, U.S. will spend $5 billion in next five years to connect up all the maritime domain awareness networks in the Quad countries so that all four countries have the picture of entire Indo-Pacific at all times. That's a big commitment and the work has commenced. So what will happen is that the Indian Navy's uh, Maritime Domain Awareness Network that I'm talking about, the one in Singapore, which is also linked to a few in Philippines and other places in the South China Sea, and one in Pacific, which is actually operated by the Australians from Solomon Island. And these are in the process of being connected. You can imagine, Adi, that in such a huge space, you will have all ships being monitored at all times. But that is required. Either if you have to, it is not meant for warring. It is meant for saving the seafarers from piracy attacks, from drone attacks now, as you can see, from hijacking, narcotics trafficking, illegal fishing, IUU as we call it. So all this can be known only if we know who's where. So we reach there absolutely in time. And firstly, we made sure that people on board those ships, they are taken to safety and they are not exposed to fire. Then we got the Coast Guard ships close by who were capable of doing firefighting. I'm talking about the first two cases. First two places. They did the firefighting, they doused the fire and then shifted the crew, those who were injured, they were brought to the warships, they were given treatment and all of them were not Indians, you know. So that is how we managed to get them and we get them every time. It has never happened that somebody is kept. You may recall in 2008, the first time ever a pirate ship was sunk by a naval ship was by Indian Navy off the Gulf of Aden, outside, very close to Somalia. That pirate ship was shot off. And of course, they were all the, the pirates who were in water. They were taken prisoners. There were cases for compensation that we kept fighting in the ICJ, International Court of Justice, and we just won the case last year. You know that, no, it was in the protection of the seafaring community. What happened yesterday? <clears throat> On Friday evening, the ship, he made a, made a call on a maritime emergency frequency that his ship has been boarded by six, seven unknown people, they are armed. So they had boarded and obviously they must have been threatening him. And that message was picked up by the, the UK center, the, 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 you know, the, what Foundation is called this? Yeah. Distress, the distress call pickup center by UK, which is in the Gulf. And they obviously immediately passed it to the, uh, to the Gurdwara center. And then it was just a matter of time because the INS Chennai, the guided missile destroyer, indigenously built. Uh, he was on patrol very close to the mouth of Gulf of Eden. And he was told to proceed with full speed to the position which was now known. But in the meantime, as I mentioned that our maritime patrol aircraft are always on patrol, is the same PHI which we have bought from the US, yes. the Boeing aircraft. 12. Now, it came... Obviously, in, in 35, 40 minutes, he was on top of the ship. Uh, and by early morning, he had established contact, radio contact with the crew of the ship. And they told the all the sort of uh, what was happening on board, where was the... And uh, these aircraft have also got a loud broadcast system, which can be heard down below. So he flew very close number of times and he warned the... I know the pirates, or I don't know who, who they are, that uh, I'll come to that later when you talk about geopolitics. The, uh, uh, they were warned that the Indian Navy Marine Commandos are on the way. If you continue to be on board, you will be shot. And it is good for you to vacate the ship and just get back to from where, where you came from. Three, four warnings were given. In the meantime, Indian Naval Ship Chennai came close. It launched its helicopter 
to see that upper deck there was nobody with a gun. After confirming that there was nobody, the marine commandos they were launched in a uh, you know ruggedized boat if you like. Uh, there's a team of whatever seven, eight, nine. They went to the ship and they climbed up the ship using a grapnel anchor. You know, they throw the anchor on top and then right. they climb the ropes. They climbed up and immediately took position. And first they sanitized the upper deck to ensure that there was nobody who was going to fight with them. And uh, then they asked the crew to remain in Citadel. Citadel is a safe place. So they had shut down the engine and the ship was just drifting in the sea. It was not under command, not under control. And they were in Citadel. So there was nobody to drive the ship, if you like. And having ensured that they were in Citadel, the, the Marine commandos dispersed as per their standard operating procedure. And they went deck by deck. Compartment by compartment. We saw the video. Oh, they you were saw step by step. Yes. Absolutely. And, and they were climbing those ladders. You saw them. Yes. And in the meantime, all the crew, by part of these commandos, they were shifted to the ship, this Chennai. So that in case there is a pot shot taken by the terrorists or hijackers or whatever you call them, that they would be safe. Right? They were all taken to Indian naval ship and you saw those people chanting Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Uh, and once the commandos had fanned out to every compartment and ensured that nobody, they declared that there are no gunmen on board. It is possible that when they were threatened, they would have been the cover of darkness. They would have disembarked and gone back on a boat that they came from. After that, the Indian engineers part came along with the crew of the ship into back into the ship. They restarted the engine. They made sure that power was restored. Everything was done. And then they were asked to proceed to wherever they were going. I think they were headed to Bahrain. So it had uh, 15 Indian crew and six Filipinos. All were on board the Indian ship. And they, all of them were transferred. So this is what actually happened. Uh, if it surprises uh, people, I would say that uh, here in India, we were not surprised because we have been doing it regularly. It is just that earlier we were not part of this entire, uh, you know, the framework that we are talking about. Now, coming to the geopolitics, I have spoken on two, three channels in the last uh, two, three days, yeah. last two days. My, my belief, I may be wrong, but my belief that from the time the Houthis have become very active, they have started hitting the merchant ship, targeting ships in the Red Sea, which is a fallout of the Israel-Hamas war. They have taken it as a war of religions, clash of civilizations, if you like. And uh, the suddenly this case of uh, piracy and hitting of the merchant ships and the tankers has also picked up uh, you know, uh, by, by the drones. So I would say, I would say, I make a very wild guess that Houthis also require money to buy weapons. We all know which country is supporting them and that country is under sanction. They may not be able to fund everything. And it is a fundraising effort by using the pirates of Somalia to hijack ships, threaten the ships and where does that money go? Where that ransom money goes? I have been saying this for many years that piracy in Somalia is actually being controlled by organizations who are involved in terrorism. Where does the terror financing come from? These are the activities by which the terror, so terrorism is financed. And I would not be surprised that uh, this case also actually relates to, uh, you know, one of those gangs who require money. And that is why pirates don't get more than five, six hundred dollars. That's all they get. And they will not do this. kind. I mean, they're just paid for the, you know, it's a service which they provide. They're not very well to do. The 
you know the core of this piracy lies over land it doesn't lie over sea over land it is with some terror organization where the funding is being done by these activities so that's why you know, no, nowadays we don't even know who's benefiting what like the information is so much i mean they we can only see the direct or indirect beneficiary when the stock market goes up or down in the us or anywhere else yeah so uh, uh, tell me what you gave a very inside scoop and for the viewers it is like a for me my you know, i love these stories and and these are real ones because you you directly monitor everything w one thing people don't did not even know i think i was not knowing that uh, 24 by 7 indian navy maintains a watch so i think the indian coast guard and everything are doing a very good job and i think uh, indians also feel very secure about it that 24 by 7 they are monitoring it one thing came you mentioned about the destroyer i had a good uh, fortune of visiting a Indian Navy frigate, uh, INS Shivalik, in uh, San Diego when it came last year, two years yeah. back. Yeah. And the one general comment by the, and I have been always going to a Navy day here. I've, I'm always invited there. So when I go there and I saw Ashley Burke class, uh, Arle Burke class destroyer and Indian frigate, I could not make a difference, even though it was around 15 meters shorter. 163 by 149 yeah but still could not make a difference and one navy sailor told me this indian ship is heavily armed we have never seen such a heavily armed ship of any foreign navy but in these incidents we always mention destroyers and uh, for the viewers uh, you know destroyer is a more potent weapon platform than a frigate in terms of size and everything so how do you, why only destroyers are responding and in one incident, I also saw Coast Guard ship also being there, which is a almost looks like a large frigate, but it's not. So can you tell some that difference also for the audience, please? Now the difference between these two are uh, what you saw the two ships, uh, you know, uh, in two years ago, and you saw the so that's all is the difference. What you saw is the difference. The, the size is a little bit smaller on a frigate. Frigates are built with a specific purpose of either an anti-submarine frigate or an anti-surface frigate or anti-air frigate. <clears throat> that is how it was intended. But uh, off late, all frigates and have all uh, abilities, all three, you know, the anti-surface, anti-submarine, and uh, uh, they're slightly lightly armed smaller in size uh, and they're obviously the radius of action the range etc is a little bit low whereas destroyers are capable of very high speed and they've got you know four gas turbine engines mm. so they can do very high speed and reach the, <clears throat> the intended <clears throat> sorry intended target area pretty quickly that is one they are very heavily armed heavily armed means you know the they have got uh, surface to surface uh, missiles you know which are large more numbers of them they have got surface to air missiles instead of one launcher they will have two launchers maybe three launchers anti submarine they have heavier torpedoes to you know to attack the submarine uh, surely fairly big platform also there is a provision for command and control in the destroyers the better command and control platforms so if the flotilla commander or fleet commander, he is controlling large number of ships, then you will find that these are the uh, platforms in which the fleet commander and his staff will be. Because they require a separate communication setup. They require a separate, uh, you know, sort of deck from where they can operate. So this is by and large is the, uh, you know, and obviously they have more communication equipment. They can... Uh, they can be multitasked at one time. You know, they have, uh, they have, shall I say, helicopters, anti-submarine helicopters. They can take action against surface ship from a distance. They can control the UAVs like NQ-9, you know, the one predator I was talking about, the Sea Guardian. They have control system. 
they have systems by which they can transfer the uh, pictures of of this UAV camera into their own shape. So they're a little more better organized, bigger shape, bigger platform, and a lot of weapon systems. So I think the, uh, uh, you know, the differences are quite a lot. Uh, as I said, broadly, they're slightly smaller frigates, slightly slower, but by and large, they have very similar equipment, lesser numbers, less capable in command and control. I had a good fortune of going on the Michael Mansoor also. Oh. And which is one zero zero one. It's a, it's a very unique design. It's a, and I mean you don't see those kind of ships anywhere. But, but yeah. I saw the vertical launch tubes. I mean it had almost like hundred and ten tubes to launch missiles. Oh. Heavily, heavily armed, and uh, amazing, good experience. Coming back to this incident we were discussing, Houthi had Houthi rebels, and there was one sh missile stuck missile or drone i don't know but i want to know the inside scoop from you what it was because that ship has returned back to the indian shipyards and there must be some forensic and other checks must be done and everything is silent now nobody's talking about it so whether it was a drone or a missile so how did that happen and and what is our assessment what is your assessment actually on on this incident also because it really I saw Rajnath Singh Ji commenting that we will find the culprit from the bottom of the sea. And and people were speculating bottom of the sea means submarine launch or it was a land-based attack. What is your view on that incident? You know, the ship was uh, brought to Indian Harbor and the forensic experts, explosive experts have all gone and visited and they have confirmed that it was a slightly low yield weapon which was fired from a drone so it is confirmed that it is fired from drone drones can't carry very heavy weight as you know right. so it was a slightly low yield uh, missile attack onto this area fortunately uh, the damage was under, brought under control very quickly uh, because because the was know, towards ships, the back of the ship right towards the back of the ship that's that's good Stern and yeah, that's good. So it took twenty. Now the worry, worrying part is that it was only about two hundred and twenty-seven, two hundred and thirty uh, miles from the Indian coast, and it was slightly northwards. It was not towards the Gulf of Aden. So there is a possibility that some some countries who are uh, adversarial to the you know the quad countries, particularly India, uh, they are also using these drones from uh, trade ships which are floating around at sea. Because I don't see, uh, we don't find that drone of that size would have flown from shore, which was nearly 600 miles, 500 miles, and come this far to carry out an attack. Uh, and therefore, our belief is that it is quite possible that this uh, drone was had taken off from a commercial ship at sea. And that is why he was able to make it. If that is happening, then, you know, we are in for a very long haul as far as the maritime security is concerned. And I think that, uh, you know, we all of us have to be aware, uh, particularly the Quad countries, uh, because... If we are, if the democracies or the democracies, democratic countries are targets, then I would I would think that you know uh, the four so called the beacons of democracy in our own regions, in the U.S. for the whole world, India in the Indian Ocean region, uh, you know, then Japan in the in the part of Pacific South China Sea, and Australia in the Pacific, uh, we need to be worried. Because is it a clash of ideologies that is leading to this? Or is it just the Israel-Hamas war which is going on? Either way, either way, in both cases, I would say that ideology is playing a very important role. And uh, I, would, I would believe that, yes, uh, Minister Rajnath Singh was right. Uh, we will get to know all as to what was the weapon, uh, which all 
UAVs, you know, the drones carry those weapons. Which drones are built where? So this is not, not uh, going to be too long. And I'm sure that a lot of forensic study and, you know, experts on drones are already working on it. We don't have the drone, unfortunately, trying to look for the remains of the missile or the damage that it has caused and uh, make a very good estimate as to, and we will, of course, be helped by our uh, two plus two intelligence sharing partners like the US, the UK and Australia uh, and some more. Uh, these these countries also would have monitored. They will go through the entire communication which would have taken place. Communication not only meaning voice communication, you know, and even the coded messages. Signals, at least it yeah. will give you indication that yes, there was some transaction of communication was going on. So we will we will very much will get to the root and we will come to know very soon that uh, the drone belonged to which country, which all countries are operating drone manufactured in so-and-so country. There are countries who are exporting drones. So I can't say that uh, just because it is manufactured in so-and-so country, they are the ones who have done it. Not necessarily. Everybody doesn't manufacture drones. So it is worrisome because it is not very far from the Indian coast and it was, the ship was heading. It was a, fortunately, this was a, uh, not an Indian flagship, but the entire crew was Indian. And the cargo was Indian. So we have a responsibility. As you know that we have a, a anti-piracy, anti-terrorism act, which has now become a law, by which any attack on Indian citizens on board any ship, which may or may not be carrying Indian flag, it will be treated as if it is an attack on our own country, on our own people. And accordingly, the actions will be taken. So it's a serious issue. Very serious because you know it's a we have a combined task force coalition task force and uh, unfortunately the countries who are have good uh, relations with India some of them don't have very good relation with the US uh, and that can cause a little bit of diplomatic uh, hurdle uh, but I'm sure that you know the Americans are very uh, understanding, as you know, that uh, in spite of all the sanctions, they accepted India buying oil from Russia, which is a recent example. And I, th I think that uh, in this case also, they will have a fairly good, uh, fairly good, uh, you know, the uh, understanding, and I, I would think so. So we one, have a problem. One One interesting thing is there, which you just mentioned just now, and really, I'm really enjoying our conversation. I can tell you that because you are giving so much insight, which, which I did not know, to be frank. My area of study is not this area. So one question comes to the mind is, with all the things happening in the American politics, you must be very well aware of it. And the confusion which is creating where Gerald Ford was pulled back from Mediterranean Ocean and uh, I had the good fortune of being on that ship as well, and uh, and and it is it is like a and and is being pulled off from there for various reasons. The long deployment can be one reason, and with all the allies, you know that is that itself can be questioned a little bit. That how because you can easily replace the sailors, American naval ships can port at uh, Italy, can port at any of the Mediterranean ports. They can do that easily all naturalized and and also the black sea fleet of russians right there and which they openly said they have pointed kinzal at some of the ships in the red sea area and and the iranians uh refusing they had any hand in this and houthis also any hand in this do you think there is a foul play here anywhere which indians should be aware of that See, it's uh, uh, it's quite possible, but uh, pulling out of Gerald Ford, I would think that it was more of a routine, and the the assessment of the U.S. Navy was that the aircraft carrier of that size was not required, possibly because what the other assets they had, good enough to contain if, in case it becomes a bigger war. So you don't have to have full power everywhere, you know, full strength not required. Once you know that, yes, situation is under control or situation does not call for an aircraft carrier presence of that size, 
there's no point keeping it in gauge form because see all said and done aircraft carrier in close vicinity of another ship so it becomes a very lucrative target absolutely right? and it's therefore well yeah once the power projection is over once the you know thing is over then uh, you know it can be pulled back we we do that all the time we don't keep all ships at one place because then the other requirement i mean after all us navy is is a world navy you know doesn't have requirement only in mediterranean they are deployed in south china sea indian ocean pacific you know they are all over the world i mean they are the most powerful navy in the world at the moment so you know it's a is their duty really so not to get bogged down but how do you compare that indian navy is taking fast action and american navy cannot take any action how is that they fired on no. four ports actually uh, though by the way iran uh, yeah. sorry no 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 it is not that when you have coalition partnerships as long as some partner is there available and indian navy is in larger number we are near home in indian ocean indian navy is near home and therefore uh, you know and they have, of course all of them were monitoring all of them were in the vicinity they know that yes indian navy is gone there it will do the job had it required uh, more assets indian navy would have certainly said okay come on just get closer because i think we require we have a bigger problem at hand so when you have a coalition partnership everybody need not be there in fact in indian ocean and i say this with great conviction by meaning no offense indian navy is quite capable of ensuring sea lane security to the global commons not only to indian ships not only indian flagship any ship there are 1 lakh 60000 merchant ships transiting through the indian ocean in a year 1 lakh 100000 1 lakh 50 60000 right 60, so we have 24/7 monitoring as you know and i men- mentioned that satellites etc we have ships deployed in uh, in fact when we are doing the anti piracy patrol we were escorting ships none of them were indian flag ships none of them were destined for india but we had taken a commitment that no we will this is in the indian ocean and we should be the first choice for security by any country we are the preferred security partner we don't call ourselves you know you know the, that we are the chosen security partner and we are the only secure no we are preferred by most of the countries because of our size because of our commitment sea lane security adi is the primary function of navy it doesn't matter it is sea lane of sea lanes of communication security is not a particular indian ship security as i said 90% ships flying around are merchant ships they are involved in trade after all it is adding to the economy of a particular country right it is adding to you know well being of people and that is why when prime minister modi says vasudhaiv kutumbakam the whole world is a family he means it right. you you have you are such knowledgeable on you know geeta and ramayan you we have been saying that for a long long time and we practice it to be honest you know we have also pulled out pakistani nationals from hijacked ships yes. and dispatched them by flight back to pakistan so it has so at sea sea farers have a right which does not recognize any nationality correct they are all seafarers and the same ship can be carrying goods from india can be carrying goods from other places anywhere like everybody anywhere anybody ship netherland has got so much of trade in the indian ocean you know your viewpoint is like a soldier's viewpoint because soldiers is protection of national interest plus at the same time uh, it's a india's bigger commitment to the world also it puts yeah. us india in a better light also because it's yeah. not just is not just india it's it's the us also needs indian help india needs us help like you're saying yeah, yeah, how they cooperate in in all these incidents and so the pol- the international politics or geopolitics we see from the state department or in the us it doesn't matter in these operations in these operations are purely secure securing the sea lanes true now coming to the next question because the indian navy is known for the highest component of indigenous 
content and technology in India sure. of sure. all the three courses. Sure. And uh, and they are the ones who build their own ships and engines and everything. Yeah. One question comes to the mind is the, the fighter jets. The fighter jets India uses a MiG-29K and uh, probably Rafael and probably Tejas also. So how important does this force projection needed in this area? Or is there a need for it or is it only offensive operations? No, I, I, again, it's, uh, I would say, very, uh, very great question, really. Very, very incisive. You know, when you go back to the history of indigenization, the Navy was the first one to jump in. Absolutely. Because we had imagined that our job will be to secure sea lanes of communication between Gulf of Aden and Malacca Strait. 3,000 kilometers. So the government will never have so much money to buy so many ships from other countries. And therefore, we must build our own ships. And that is why the public sector units, shipbuilding public sector units were tasked with this. They had their own design bureau. You know, it is in early, in late 60s that we produced our first ship. And uh, early 70s, the first Leander class uh, frigate was built in India. Unfortunately, in the aerospace sector, we didn't do very well. You know, we did make HF-24 Maru, but, uh, you know, it so happened that, you know, it did not progress beyond that. So in the aerospace sector, we are quite, we have a lot of catching up to do. And Tejas is the first aircraft which is built in India. The engine is, uh, in, engine is not built in India. It's a F-414 engine, 404 engine, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by G. So that technology, the metallurgical technology, we are we have a long way to catch up because that is one technology which was denied to India during the Industrial Revolution by the British. And that is why we are so far behind because that required a lot of you know, making of alloys, uh, very fine grinding, etc., etc. It required very high technology which we didn't have. But we are getting there. Now that we have a... a agreement with the US uh, in which the G engines 4 on 4 will be manufactured in India and 90% will be indigenously built only 10% will remain with the US which I guess any country would like to protect its own uh, fine technology but uh, we also have a you know bilateral uh, arrangement already in action with France where we are manufacturing saffron engines uh, in India uh, for the okay. MMRCA, for the, you know, um, what shall I say, middleweight uh, multi-role combat aircraft. MRFA. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and um, multi-role basically. Yeah. Uh, and that will have 100% transfer of technology from the bridge. So we are getting there, but aerospace, yes, we have a lot of catching up. On ship side, we started in 60s. That is why we make all our ships, including the aircraft carrier. But we don't make engines. We don't make, you know, the gas turbine engines, which should happen now with this, you know, full focus on uh, uh, getting the technology and making engines ourselves. We tried, we didn't succeed very much, but that engine now will be probably be used, the Kaveri engine will be used on board ships as a gas turbine engine, hopefully. You know, for the viewers, I'll just add a little bit that the India can make rocket engines are totally different caliber and yeah. plane is a totally different caliber because yeah. uh, a human being is sitting on the engine. So that adds to all the complexities, including That's good. all the latest things that you need and which I don't know, I'll ask some Air Force person for that information. Uh, so one last question on this point, you, you, uh, and it's a real honor to have you on the show for us, for all of us here. Uh, the India... U.S. relations on the political side are not the best based on all the media reports. I have no personal insight into any of those things. As Indian American, I always think that we should have very good relations to largest democracies, but politics is completely different ballgame altogether. And sometimes some technologies are denied, some technologies are allowed, which any country would like to do that. India also won't sell the latest Brahmos technology to anyone. India will not send their sell their latest technologies and shipbuilding to anyone also. 
So same way, other countries also do that. So how do you see the future of Indo-US partnership when, uh, when some people, when some state department or something delays the engine technology F404, 414, and uh, India obviously has a backup plan because Indian interest is to protect Indian interest, period. Just like American interest is to protect American interest. And with the decentralization of global policing power. Because when Rajnath Singh Ji said, we are the net security provider in the Indian Ocean region, that was a very powerful statement, actually. So how do you see that, sir? Well, I'll start from uh, your last statement. The statement of net security provider was first time used by Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, she made a statement when pivot to Asia was done that India will, India is the net security provider. Though we, we choose not to say that. We say we are a preferred security partner and not net security partner. So that is what. The second, I have a little bit of a different view, Adi, as far as Indo-US relations are concerned. I think the Indo-US relations are on a very strong, sound footing. Uh, you know, natural partners to big democracy, oldest and, uh, you know, largest democracy. It is just that US is beginning to understand India now more and more. You know, it's hoisting India's uh, requirements and yet accepting that, yes, it is doing it for the benefit of its own people. It is not that it is any pro-Russia or pro-so-and-so and anti-so-and-so. No. As we say that we are here, whole world is our family, but the priority will be taken by our own countrymen. If our countrymen require cheaper oil, we will buy from wherever it is available. U.S. can put a sanction, but I can't afford to buy that, uh, you know, a very high, uh, high cost fuel. So, uh, you know, our uh, minister uh, Jaisankar said it in very clear terms. He said, fair enough. You have to accept it because I can't buy it from the, you know, the increased prices. If you bring down the price, I mean, in fact, in last uh, quarter, the Russians have also increased the price. And in many sectors, the oil purchase from Russia has decreased. Because there are some Gulf countries who are now willing to sell oil at the similar price as the Russians. So I think when you talk about the world geopolitics, you know, these are, every country is not at the same level. But every country is aspiring to become a big country, a powerful country. Whereas in our case, our democratic institutions are very sound. Our democracy is absolutely firm and very vibrant. The U.S. has realized this. It does not matter whether I buy oil from him or her. It doesn't make a difference. Why? My ultimate aim is to have free and open sea tallies with that of the U.S. So I think that diplomatically, politically, we are very much, very much in sync with the U.S. policies. There's no doubt about that. There will be differences. I mentioned this probably in your last program or somewhere else that when it comes to maritime, there is complete convergence in the thoughts of the US and India. They will never differ, right? Because it's a free and open sea of the whole world. That's right. Whereas when it comes to continental strategy, Adi, they will differ. Right. And they will always differ. Because India looks at the continental part of its border with the prism of protecting the integrity of the country's boundaries. Very well In said. that, who has helped, who has not helped. And accordingly, India acts with them. Whereas the US looks at the continent as a global strategy. Is US going to keep, maintain its global hegemony, global leadership, or is it going in the hands of countries who have different ideology? So that is the big difference and that will remain. Right. Because India is not aspiring to become a global power. It cannot. Well, look at the difference in uh, you know, the GDP. Look at the difference in human development index. You look at the per capita income. 
nowhere. Even economy. It's not possible. Because there is so much of lead by the US in all these aspects. Whereas India was a colony for a very long time. True. So we have decolonized and gradually we will get there. We will get there. You know, from starting from nowhere, we are now at the fifth largest economy in the world. And I believe that by all estimation, by 2030-35, we should be the third largest economy. Even so, before, way before that. Yeah, I, I, inshallah, it should happen. But everybody is working in that direction. So I would say that, no, US-India partnership is on very sound footing. If something is not happening in time, because of US will take a little more time to understand. Now, for example, now, I mentioned that the manner in which Indian Navy is reacted in last three cases, US will be, they will be very happy to part with more technologies and give India more assets. After all, the maritime security, India is a partner of US and US will not be here all the time. The best US has come to realize that US Navy cannot be present everywhere all times. They're also getting stretched because they have got the adversaries who are catching up with them. Their adversaries are catching up with the US and therefore you will find that US has realized that these four countries who are partners of the Quad, these three countries must be made capable of taking on the common adversary in the maritime zone. So for that to happen, you have to, you have to show, you know, you, you know proof of pudding is in eating. That's right. So, okay. so now America is beginning to see that no, India has, is doing its job. It has not only protected Indian flagship, it has protected every possible ship. It has also assisted. It has, you know, that, okay, the crew may have been Indian, but it was not carrying any cargo from anywhere to anywhere from India. Okay. It's going to Bahrain. Possibly it was heading, it, cargo may have been heading for the fifth fleet. You never know. Okay. We don't get into any details. So, but the, the problem that I see, the combined task force, etc., if it becomes a ideological fight in which U.S. alone is involved, then the Indians will have to have some diplomatic understanding. Now, what are the missions in which they should be together? What are the missions when they will not be together? Because of our own principles. Absolutely. It our doesn't mean that we oppose. No, we don't oppose. That's right. We support. But... You know, the you are at a different level. India is not a global power. You are a global power. We are only making sure, ensuring peace, stability in the Indian Ocean region so that it becomes safe for trade, safe for operation, safe for passage. Any country, not only India. I have two more questions, but I'm going to put it for the next show because you... you I. You know, and I'll tell the audience also, and you as well. Maldives and Lakshadweep becoming the second aircraft carrier yeah. for India, yeah. And Andaman Nicobar and China, and but we'll put it on the next episode because I'll, I'll be happy. You give me a couple of dates, and I will, yes. you know, I'll make sure that we'll do it. And, and as I said, in the month of March, I will be in Phoenix. Yes, and we'll definitely meet over here. Yeah, and and. For all the viewers, this was Admiral Shekhar Sinaji and uh, amazing, amazing insights. I mean, you will now hear this kind of information and is, is right from the, you can say, uh, you know, bad example to use, but English is a funny language, horse's mouth. So let me, let, before you go, let me tell you that I am a naval pilot. Therefore, you don't have to wait for Air Force to answer those questions. Oh, amazing, amazing. I'm an aircraft carrier pilot. So <laughs> amazing, amazing. Actually, so I read your profile, but I so and it escaped my mind. Thank you so much, uh, Admiral Sinaji, and for all the viewers who are watching, do like, share, subscribe, and let us know your feedback. And then the last show was super hit. We all know that. So do comment and let us know your feedback. And we'll come back with two additional questions I have we'll answer in the next show. Thank you. Thank you, Adiji, and thank you to all your viewers and very happy new year. Have Thank a great you. year ahead, a peaceful year ahead, and prosperous year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste.